everyone. Hope you all are doing well. Um, luckily, today is the last day of it being hot, which is good. Come on, Sarah. Come on, Sarah. Come on. Sorry. My dog was out on the porch with me. I'm going to get her back inside because she's going to start crying. So um, let's get started. We're going to continue on our train of evolution. So we've got a couple more cases of um, <clears throat> natural selection to, to sort of think about. Um, and we're looking at more contemporary versions of this um, this case. But just as a reminder, we were talking about evolution, which is simply how things change over time. Uh, evolution being simply uh, the way we can account for the vast species diversity on this planet, both at the global scale as well as locally. So you can think of something like Massachusetts, where we have um, you know, between five and 10,000 species of animals that live just in the state of Massachusetts, with many of those being uh, found only in Massachusetts. So evolution is what really explains this. And the mechanism that we're thinking about here is actually natural selection, whereby the environment is selecting for traits. Remember, traits being anything that you physically can see or potentially you can't see, they're sort of acting at the cellular level. So you think of things like height, um, color of your skin, uh, if you're a tree, how tall you are, how big your leaves are, things like that. A trait is anything you can sort of just physically measure about an organism, either visually or with some sort of quantitative method. And so natural selection is really selecting on the diversity of traits that are found in the ecosystem. And just to sort of reiterate, remember when you look at any given population, which is just a group of the same organisms living in, this, in one area, um, you're really thinking about uh, a very wide diversity of traits and you can just sort of see this if you go out in public. There's a huge diversity of traits, even within a very small group, such as um, if you're in Boston, right? There's a huge diversity of traits, heights, weights, hair colors, you know, nail thickness, anything you can think of. There's a huge diversity of that. So that's what evolution really acts upon. And so uh, one of the sort of interesting cases we're going to talk about going forward now is uh, thinking about Hurricane Maria. So for those of you that remember a couple years ago, um, 2016, if I'm remembering correctly, Hurricane Maria smashed through the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it was a Category 4 hurricane, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it, it uh, it's sort of what led to the destruction of, of Puerto Rico, and it hit all sorts of places in um, the Gulf of Mexico. And so this is, you know, this is pretty uh, well-known hurricane. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico had no power for like, you know, or, or huge portions of Puerto Rico had no power for like six or drive away, right? They're sort of stuck in the area, right? It's a pretty destructive force. And so some scientists um, at Harvard, they were working on lizards found in um, uh, Caribbean islands inside of, uh, in sort of in the path of Hurricane Maria. And they asked the question, can a natural disaster affect the distribution of traits in island lizards? And if, you, if you're interested in that, sort of what we're going to talk about, there is a paper that was published in Nature by Donahue et al. Again, this, like I said, this is a group from Harvard, so it's pretty awesome research. It's published in the journal Nature, which is one of the most prestigious journals in the world. Um, we'll talk about what that means later in the semester, but um, really good journal, really cool paper. So um, just as a, just sort of set it up, what's going on, they, get, they were working in the Gulf of, well, this is technically the Atlantic Ocean, but her, her, uh, Hurricane Maria sort of just barreled through. Um, so they're working on a, an island chain here. Um, and they were looking at two different sites, uh, Pine, uh, Water K and Pine K. So it's just these two uh, sites around a beach. Um, and this area got smashed by, um, first by Hurricane Irma, and then got smashed by the much more destructive Hurricane Maria. And this happened over a not very long period of time. Um, like you said, in the, I believe 2016. And what they did is they measured um, the the length of lizards, so the vent to snout ratio. Um, I'm sorry, the vent to snout length. So basically, looking at the nose to the butt. That's what vent to snout is. Um, and then they look at the forelimb toe pad area. So basically, looking at the size of their hands. And um, <clears throat> this might not seem like a really interesting thing to think about, but um, snout to vent length is pretty much how they measure the size of lizards because lizards can have really really long tails. <clears throat> 
Um, and forelimb toe pad area, sort of the, the size of their feet, is an important thing to think about for lizards simply because they're climbing. And if you have larger feet, it means you're able to climb. It also means you're able to stick to surfaces better. Because remember, many lizards can use van der Waals forces to stick to a surface. So what they did is they were looking at the comparison between how long these lizards are and how big their feet are. And what you'll notice is that we have two colored dots here. So we have black dots and we have uh, sort of opaque or white dots or um, clear dots, whatever you want to call them. And the, the clear dots are from before the hurricanes and the black dots are from after hurricanes. You can see that at both the sites, Pine K and Water K. And what you'll notice is that after the hurricane, they had significantly bigger uh, toe pad area, meaning that their feet were getting larger. And you see that at Pine K, and you see that at Water K. And it, this is independent of how big they are, because lizard, you can imagine like as you get bigger as a lizard or as you get bigger as any organism, your body parts are simply just going to grow, right? As, as a six foot tall man, my hands are probably bigger than yours if you are, say, five feet tall, right? There's a scaling, sort of the way things scale in nature is as you get bigger, your appendages get bigger as well. Now, what this, and so again, it's, we see this pattern where we have bigger feet after the hurricane than before the hurricane. So it's sort of an interesting thing, right? We had this really large natural disaster occur, <clears throat> and we're seeing a shift in toe size, we're shifting and shift in feet size, which implies, and, and this is what they came to the conclusion of, is that the hurricane was a selecting force for those with bigger feet. The idea being, if you had larger feet as a lizard, you were more likely to hang onto a rock, more likely to hang onto a tree, meaning you were more likely to survive a hurricane smashing through, right? A hurricane coming through with 150 mile an hour winds was less likely to blow you off a tree or blow you off a rock if you had larger feet. So we're seeing a shift in the distribution of traits within these populations at two sites. Which I think is pretty cool, right? And it, 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 it makes sense, right? Big, if you have big honking lizard feet, you can hang on. You're less likely to get blown off by a hurricane force wind than if you had tiny lizard feet. Which I think is pretty fascinating, right? You can see this sort of direct effects of the, the environment selecting for traits in nature. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is the sort of the distribution of these traits. Uh, there's a the variable length on, in the body size, and there's a variable length in foot size. So again, there is still, even after the hurricane was selecting for things with larger feet, um, it's, there's still variability in the traits present. Remember, that's an important thing for evolution. Evolution needs variability in traits to select upon. So that's our lizards. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, uh, for case studies, actually crazy moth tongues. And uh, this is my favorite example of all examples. Um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And it's a... Uh, it's a really cool case of evolution, just like, really? This is really what you chose to do? This is really the traits you selected for, but this is what we find in nature. So we're gonna talk about this. It's wacky and wild. <clears throat> so um, as you all know, nothing lives in solidarity. There is no organism that lives by itself. Even humans, we like to think we live in our houses. We don't live alone. We're surrounded by animals, we're surrounded by insects. And then more importantly, we are surrounded by tons and tons of bacteria. So nothing lives in solidarity. And you would imagine if nothing can live in solidarity, not even humans, um, even the astronauts up at the, at the International Space Station, they don't live in solidarity. They have other humans, they have their microbes. But you can imagine that those that are living in solidarity, um, that are not living in solidarity, there might be some sort of evolutionary forces acting upon them jointly, right? You can imagine that if I'm a squirrel living in the forest and I'm a bird living in the same forest, well, we live in the same environment, Natural selection might work similarly on both of us because we have the same natural conditions affecting us. So the question you can ask is, given that, can organisms evolve together? And we're going to talk about one crazy type of what we call co-evolution or organisms evolving together. And so <clears throat> there's an orchid native to Madagascar. And if you'll remember from Darwin's voyage, he stopped over at Madagascar. And while he was on Madagascar, uh, Darwin noticed this, or this orchid, uh, Angracium uh, scesquipedidel. I think that's how you say it. I'm terrible with Latin names, but we'll go with that. Looks like this, looks just like a regular orchid. It's just very big. Um, but the exciting thing about this orchid is you'll notice here, this sort of little thing dangling down. 
it's not its stem, it's what we call its pollen sac. Um, <clears throat> and so Darwin, when Darwin was there, he remarked 11 and a half inches long with only the lower inch um, and half filled with sweet nectar. What can be the use, it may be asked, of a nectarary of such disproportional length? And you can see that this little pollen tube, this little nectar tube, I'm sorry, this little nectar tube that these flowers have that are designed to draw in pollinators like beetles, like flies, like moths, like butterflies, just to drink this sweet nectar, to get tagged with pollen, and then go pollinate another plant. You can see it's disproportionately long given the size of the plant. It is huge. 11 inches is enormous for a little pollen tube. You gotta remember, most insects are tiny, right? They're only, most are less than, a, less than an inch, right? Even the biggest things you see out there nowadays, they're only a few inches big. And so to have something that's 11 and a half inches long and knowing that you need some insects to pollinate it, you look at it and go, what the heck can do that? How can you pollinate something that is so massive? Well, <clears throat> um, we can keep going and think a little bit more about this. You can hypothesize that if there's something that has a pollen tube, I'm sorry, a nectar tube that long, there must be an animal that has a, a, a proboscis or what you use to feed on, on um, nectar that is that long as well, because there wouldn't be this sort of egregious form of evolution if there wasn't something to back it up. And so Darwin, <clears throat> Darwin uh, continued to work um, as a scientist after he came back from his voyage, and he remarked later in his life, he said, I have just received such a box full from Mr. Bateman with astounding agracium, the, 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 uh, the, um, the orchid, with a nectary a foot long, good heavens, what insect can suck it? And um, and so he, uh, he drew, or he had, I'm sorry, he had an artist draw what a potential insect might look like. So we have such a, such the plant with its monster nectarary just dangling, right? It's huge, right? It's bigger than the leaves on this plant. And he hypothesized that, in fact, there had to be some insect out there with a monster proboscis or monster tongue to take advantage of this nectar hanging out 11 inches down here. And so you would hypothesize based upon this crazy type of trait that there's something that has a matching trait because insects are super important to plants. Plants need insects to pollinate them. They need them to pass their genetic material on to the next generation. <clears throat> and so you would hypothesize that there's probably something that likes, probably something that matches this orchid. And um, well, uh, Moving on a little bit, in 1867, um, Alfred Russell Wallace, you remember he independently derived the theory of evolution about the same time as Darwin, he predicted such an insect would exist. And he, he remarked that such, such a moth exists in Madagascar may be safely predicted. And naturalists who visit the island should search for it with as much confidence as astronomers search, as, as, as astronomers search for the planet Neptune, and they will be equally successful. And uh, for those of you that aren't uh, familiar with sort of how the sort of really outside planets were discovered, um, the outside planets were predicted based upon their gravity. And they, they said, okay, based upon what we can see, we uh, predict that this is there. And eventually they found it. And so what he's saying is we can predict that this, there's some sort of insect out there and thus it is likely there. And um, so he's looking for this. And the, the actually sort of interesting thing is he was right. So later on, uh, I think a few decades later, people were studying in Madagascar, and they found this moth, Xanthopan morgani. They named it after um, our friend Morgan back here. And he found, they found a moth with an 11-inch proboscis, 11-inch tongue. So something that matched the absurd length of the nectary in this orchid. And it's absolutely astounding. This is what it looks like. This is what its tongue looks like. It rolls up like... Um, like, I don't, I can't even think of a good analogy, but like, you can think of it like, uh, if you ever had the, the, uh, the licorice that's rolled up in like a really tight circle, it looks like that. And so they discovered this moth and it matched perfectly. And then they made observations saying, hey, look, this moth feeds on this absurdly long flower. And if you wanna see what that looks like, there's a YouTube video here of this moth with its crazy long tongue feeding on this flower. It's absolutely wild. I, I, I recommend you take a, a peek at it at some point. But as I mentioned, this is what we call coevolution. that two, a, two animals, I'm sorry, two organisms are evolving together. So in the same environment and they're being selected upon. 
And the way they're being selected upon is not just by nature, but they're being selected upon by one another. So you can imagine that maybe there was a mutant in population of the orchids, and there was only mutants from the population of moths that could feed on it. And they sort of just, over time, as they became more and more successful, right, they were passing on their genes for the next generation, the population shifted so that we would only have orchids with, say, long nectaries or moths with long proboscis or long tongues. And so we're having this sort of co-evolution together where they're essentially pressing on each other. It's really not nature that's pressing. It's more so um, these organisms that are pressing on one another. And this is what happens when this sort of gets out of control. I mean, there's lots of examples of this uh, sort of co-evolution when um, things aren't this crazy, but this is sort of what happens when you push it to a, the extreme, where you get something as absolutely absurd as an 11 inch long tongue in an insect that is only about, well, it varies, but it's only about say two inches, maybe an inch and a half. It's a very, very tiny insect, but its tongue is, you know, three times, four times the length of its body. So picture like you having a tongue that was four times as long as your body. It would be like me having a tongue that was 24 inches long. I mean, I'm sorry, 24 feet long, which is just sounds frightening. So, so this is coevolution, organisms pressing on one another. Um, next up, we're going to talk about a similar case, but instead of organisms, in this case of natural speaking, we're going to talk about what happens when humans push on one another. I'm sorry, when humans push on other organisms. And you can imagine that given how destructive we are, given how huge of an impact we have on this planet, that this might be a particularly powerful evolutionary force. That humans are by far the most uh, powerfully uh, sort of, not uh, destructive is the, right, is the right word, but not the word I want to use, but sort of the most influential species that has ever existed on the planet. No organism on this planet has ever impacted the planet um, in such a short period of time as we have. And so you can imagine, given that power that we have, we might be able to push evolution in a different way. And so there's a really classical example here. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, it occurred in England during the Industrial Revolution. And so there's a peppered moth, and this is what the moth looks like. It does look like salt and pepper mixed together. It's native to England. It's only found in England. And uh, what this moth liked to do is it, it liked to have this color, this sort of black and white color, which allowed it to blend in with lichen that you find on birch trees. And you've seen lichen before. You never really gave any sort of mention to them. This is what lichen look like. They, you find them on rocks and trees. They're green and they're white and they're yellow. Um, they're sort of this nondescript thing that grows on flat surfaces. Um, you probably never gave any sort of second thought to them. But these lichen are everywhere. So like when I look out in my backyard, every tree has lichen. When I walk in through Boston, you see everything has lichen on it. They're really, they're really cool organisms that we're going to talk about um, next class. But this moth in particular, is colored to match the lichen. And the lichen it's colored to match are the, are the lichen that are black and white here. Um, so given this sort of natural color of the, of the, of the moss, um, there is a mutation in this moth. So sort of a naturally occurring change in the DNA that causes um, these moths to turn completely black. And you can imagine like if you rely on this speckled pattern to match a white lichen or to match a white tree, well, Turning all black is likely not um, ideal, right? It would, it would imply to you that if I was trying to survive on a white tree, I'd be picked off like this, right? Something black on white, that's super contrast, pick you right off if you're a, if you're a predator hunting these moths. And so these moths, um, they had sort of this really um, uneven distribution where about 99% of the moths look like this and 1% of the moths were completely black. And so we can ask the question, what happens when humans intervene in this situation? And as I'm sure you know, um, there is no sort of discrepancy between humans and nature. We invite animals into our cities. They come in happily to feast on our garbage and all the other stuff that is there. So there's always insects, there's always animals inside of our cities. Um, but in particular, um, during the 1760s, in, from 1760 to 1840, the Industrial Revolution happened in the United States and England um, that really kicked us off um, in turning us into a modern society, right? This is what took us from re relying completely on horse and buggies and all that, you know, technology that's not so efficient to combusting fossil fuels to allowing us to generate our own energy. And while we were combusting fossil fuels, um, we started to turn our cities into this. We started to turn our cities into smog-filled areas. 
Uh, and this is something that still persists today. We still have awful air quality in most cities from the combustion of fossil fuels through both uh, combustion for energy as well as for transportation as well. And so in, in, uh, in these two areas, we um, started changing our cities to look like this, covering them in black soot from the combustion of coal. So completely changing the environment. And so if we think about the moth, we think about the speckled moth, and then we think about its black mutants, we would think, can a moth, well, first of the question we could ask is, would you find moths here? And the answer to that question is yes, there's always going to be moths, there's always going to be insects around humans, they like us. Um, but the question we can ask is, do you think white moths would be adapted to this dark environment, right? Do you think that black and white speckled moth would do well in a completely black environment? Because as you can see, these buildings are covered in soot from coals, they're covered, they're black, nasty. Um, and the sort of the short answer to this question is no, a speckled, a, white, a moth that's white and mostly white with a little bit of black speckled in, isn't going to do very well in an all white background. The same way a completely black moth is not going to do well against a white tree or white lichen. And so <clears throat> one thing we found is that, uh, I'm sorry, one thing that they found, I, I didn't find anything, um, is that in, in Manchester 1948, sort of at the start of the Industrial Revolution, um, there was 98% black moths. So these, in this environment, which was prior to the Industrial Revolution, not covered in all black soot, um, there was sort of a natural distribution where you had mostly these peppered moths and very few of these black moths. Remember, being black and white surfaces, not exactly ideal. However, after the Industrial Revolution kicked in and we had all this soot being produced, we had a complete shift where in the cities we'd find 98% of these black moths and only about 2% of these white speckled moths. And the idea being is that the black soot was an environmental force that was selecting for the proliferation of these black moths. Oh, shoot. Ah, there we go. Sorry, the video cut up there for a second. Um, but the idea being is that the, in nature, these black moths um, were in very low abundance, but because of the Industrial Revolution, because the environment changed to be mostly black, it acted as a selecting force to select for the, um, essentially the prevalence of this trait over this trait because this trait was no longer beneficial. And if you had this trait, you were more likely to, re to get energy, you were more likely to reproduce and pass on your traits to the next generation, thus shifting the balance between black and white moths. And so um, remember, this is something that's really, really rare in nature naturally because the black soot isn't a thing in nature, right? But it's, it is present in a human-based setting. And so when we call this sort of human pressure, we call this what we call an artificial selection when humans um, unnaturally impose some sort of selective force on organisms. And what we're seeing here is an accidental selection, right? This production of soot wasn't in, was it, was it like designed to change the moths, but it did. It changed them from being mostly black, I'm sorry, mostly white to mostly black. Um, but we have been using artificial selection throughout our entire history. Pretty much everything you can think of um, that we use in our everyday life, whether if it's biological in origin, is a, is been affected by um, artificial selection. And so, for instance, this is what wild lettuce looks like. So, wild iceberg lettuce. It's spiky. It's not so fun. But there were mutants in these populations that looked a little bit like this, which is the modern iceberg that we buy in our stores. And so, we selected for desirable traits here to make our lettuce be more appealing or potentially more nutritious, or potentially easier to eat in the case of this lettuce. You see the same thing with carrots here. So not, carrots are naturally white. We liked the mutants of the orange in the wild populations of carrots. And so as we started to cultivate carrots, we selected for this orange mutant because it was visually appealing for us. It's better than, at least most people think it's better than looking at this white carrot. And, um, so this is what we're talking about natural selection. There's tons and tons of examples. Pretty much every crop we eat has gone through some sort of artificial selection process. Even things like cats and dogs, they've gone through an artificial selection process. We've selected for traits that were beneficial to living around humans. So humans have been a monstrous, artificial, uh, monstrous form of evolutionary selection. And you can see, I think, you know, sort of these cases of these vegetables are really, um, really hit that point home. You can see this for every vegetable. You can look up wild corn, you can look up wild potatoes, you can look up wild anything, and it is so different from what you buy in the grocery store. 
whether you buy organic or otherwise. So, wacky and wild stuff that humans can do and act as an evolutionary force. And so um, sort of the last sort of weird case we're going to talk about, um, oh, this one's weird because it's, it's just weird. It's not like crazy moth tongue. It's just, it's just a bizarre thing to think about. And so the last thing we're going to talk about, and uh, you know, it's sort of a new emerging field in science, which is called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is the modification of DNA without physically changing the DNA sequence. And the idea being, um, when we're thinking about traditional evolution, traditional evolution requires modification of your DNA, right? It requires a base to change from an A to a T or a G to a C, right? It requires that change in your genetic code for a new trait to come to be or for something to be passed down to the next generation. That's how traditional evolution works. But epigenetics is weird. It's this modification your cells make to your DNA that simply modifies how the DNA is expressed, how it's translated, and how, I'm sorry, how it's transcribed, not translated. And it's kind of a weird thing, right? It affects how transcription works, so it affects how genes are being transcribed, which ultimately affects how proteins are being made. And as I've told you, proteins do sort of everything inside your cell. And so, and the sort of interesting thing about epigenetics is they are inheritable, um, but it doesn't change DNA sequences. It affects how the DNA is transcribed. And if you can affect how the DNA is transcribed, you can affect what traits are derived from that transcription. So picture, if I have a flower that has an epigenetic modification on its color, uh, on, the, on the gene that controls the, flower, the color of its flower, right? Maybe the flower with the DNA sequence I have is supposed to be white, but because of the epigenetic modification, it's now purple. That's what we're talking about. Changing how it's transcribed to change the ultimate trait. It's weird, I know. You know. It's a it's a brand new field. It's weird. But one of the sort of the best, one of the well, maybe not the best, but one of the most fascinating examples about this sort of concept of epigenetics that has um, been heavily studied is the case of the of the um, the Dutch famine. And so for those of you that aren't up to date on your World War II history, um, <clears throat> uh, Nazis were bad. Um, I, I think that's pretty straightforward. But uh, they did occupy the Netherlands from 1944 to 1945. Um, and while, while they occupied the Netherlands, they essentially blockaded the country, not allowing very much food into the country. And this led to a, essentially a year-long famine where the, it's almost the entire population of the country um, was denied meaningful amounts of nutrition. So this is what we call the Dutch famine. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you have a, a moment, there's this uh, article in um, uh, The Atlantic by Carl Zimmer. He's one of my favorite science writers of all time in terms of periodicals. Um, I would suggest taking a peek at this. It's a really fascinating um, read, and he's an incredible science writer. Um, so if you have time, I would recommend reading that. Um, but it's sort of an interesting thing, like during this famine, so this one year period, um, where the, again, essentially the entire country was starved, babies that were born during the famine were significantly smaller than before the famine, which I think makes sense, right? If you're going to make a nice, big, fat, healthy baby, the mother needs nutrition, right? A mother can't be starved. So it makes sense that if you're a mother and you're being starved, you're going to produce a smaller than average or smaller than normal baby for the Netherlands, right? That makes intuitive sense. But the weird thing about epigenetics is that through this stress, through this change to the life of, of, the, of the Dutch, this, this sort of idea of smaller than average babies has actually persisted for two generations after the famine has ended. So the babies born during this famine were smaller, but two generations after, so you're thinking 40 years after the fact, at least. Um, well, I guess 30 years after the fact, at least. Depends on when people are having kids. People had kids way too early back then, but that's neither here nor there. Um, two generations after this famine, we are still having smaller than average babies, which is just weird, right? You, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. So what's happening here is the stress of the famine is causing an epigenetic modification on the on the essentially the genomes of these people that are suffering this, which is that they're in turn passing it down to their children. 
making their children have this smaller than average baby because the DNA that these children are inheriting is saying, holy crap, I'm in the famine. I'm struggling. I need to, I need to make it, I can't invest as much energy into making a child. My child's going to be slightly smaller. That's what's going on here. That's epigenetics. And it is wild. It is a brand new field. And there's so much cool stuff we haven't learned about this, but that's the idea, that you can experience something terrible in your life and pass that terrible experience down to your children that then affects your children. That's the idea with epigenetics. It's sort of this non-traditional case of evolution. And this is something we can see in other organisms as well, not just humans. So, oops. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, if we have, say, a dandelion here and it experiences drought, it, it puts epigenetic modifications on its genome um, so that the next generation that its children are smaller. So that's sort of a real life example we know that can happen in nature. And there's all sorts of cases about epigenetics um, out there. This is something that interests you. Um, I'd be happy to send you stuff. Um, or you can do some research on your own, whatever you want to do. But epigenetics, brand new field, but really promising to understand how heredity works. Um, and it also is not just, you know, weird things like, you know, or, you know, stressing things. It also has been linked to cancer. So if, you know, um, if your dad had colon cancer, you might be more susceptible to colon cancer because of epigenetic mod uh, modifications, not just sort of genetic changes. And there is a lot to be learned here, so don't, so, so don't just sort of, um, um, you know, take everything I'm saying here without a huge amount of skepticism because it is a brand new field. It's something we're going to learn so much more about um, as in the coming decades. And it, it poses to sort of revolutionize the way we think about genetics and the way we think about evolution. Um, but one thing I wanted to pose to you, give you another chance to earn some extra credit points today, is what do you, what do you think about epigenetics? It's a weird thing. In particular, I want to know what you guys think. And again, you can dump it in the chat like you did yesterday. What do you think about thinking about epigenetics in Lamarck, right? Lamarck's idea was you can, you can do things throughout your life, use traits, and then the, through the use of those traits, you could pass those traits on to the next generation, right? Think about the, the, the fither crab, right? It's using its claw, it's using its claw. And you, he thought that you could use that using a claw to pass that down to the next generation to have offspring that had bigger than normal claws. Thinking about that with epigenetics, right? Experiencing something in your life and then passing that down. There's a really um, interesting connection between epigenetics and Lamarck. So if you, uh, if you have any thoughts on epigenetics, let me know. Um, if you have any thoughts about how epigenetics and Lamarck relate, also let me know. Um, if, you know. if you don't have any meaningful thoughts, just do it anyways, because you get various credit points and you do that. So. So that uh, sort of wraps up our part one of evolution. Um, it's sort of talking about the mechanism um, of how uh, evolution sort of comes to be, how nature selects, how natural selection works, in some cases of how this works in real life. And so we, you know, we were talking about the mechanism, that's sort of what we spent talking about. But the next thing we're going to sort of think about is how we go from changes in traits, how we go from DNA, how do we go from that to new species? How do we take this evolutionary force and make it into a new species? Because that's ultimately what we care about, right? We don't care about evolution because it can change the frequency of, of traits in a population. We care about how that change in frequency and traits in the population leads to a new species. How do we use, as I've mentioned in the first class, evolution accounts for all the diversity on this planet. How do we physically use evolution to understand how we got this diversity of this planet. And so, um, you know, this is what we sort of talked about last time, um, and we sort of reiterated this. Um, one other term I, I, I used, but wasn't, um, I didn't like sort of officially define it. I sort of skated around this term, and you've probably heard this term before, which is fitness. Um, and it's different as fitness as in like physical fitness of a human. It's simply how fitness in a, sort of an evolutionary standpoint is how well an organism is adapted to its environment. And you've probably heard this, this term called survival of the fittest. Um, survival of the fittest, you know, is sort of a, what people like to say, Darwin used to say, he never ever used that term, but survival of the fittest just refers to that those that are the most fit, the most that are best adapted to the environment are more likely to survive, to get energy, to reproduce and pass on the genetic material to the next generation. So that's what fitness is. 
And so we talked about all these cases, um, some of them more recently than others. Um, but the question I want to post to you guys, and um, um, again, this is a chance you have to dump some questions or some comments into the, um, the chat that um, sort of get you some extra credit points. But what, um, what do you, th I guess the question I want to post to you guys, and I think it's an interesting question to think about, is do you think one E. coli involving a new trait, remember the E. coli in, in Richard Lenski's experiment from yesterday, one E. coli evolved the trait to use citrate. It was the only E. coli in all 12 populations. By evolving this new trait, does it make it a new species? So does one trait make a species completely different from another? And I'll answer that question um, at the end of the class, because um, I don't want to sort of spoil it, but I'm, I'm sort of interested to think what you guys think. Does evolving a new trait make you a new species? So if I evolved uh, the capacity to photosynthesize, would that make me a new species? So. If you have any thoughts on that, please dump them in the, uh, the chat, uh, in the group chat. I'd, I'd be excited to sort of see what you guys think um, as before you sort of learned anything about what we're going to talk about. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about how we get new species today. So speciation is simply defined as one population becoming two separate populations. And the question I would ask you guys if we were in person is what do you think distinguishes two species? What sort of characteristics do you think says you're a different species, right? What makes us a distinct species from chimpanzees, right? We're 99% similar at the genetic level as to a chimpanzee. But what makes us of, what makes us a different species than chimpanzees? And sort of the easiest, uh, sort of one, a really nice example of this is actually the meadowlark. So these are birds, you see these here in Massachusetts if you're paying attention. Um, they're kind of they're kind of nice looking birds. I like the yellow on their on their on their breast. Looks looks pretty cool. Um, but there's an eastern meadowlark and a western meadowlark. Oops. And um, these two birds, one lives on the eastern coast of the United States, and the other one lives on the other side of the Rocky Mountains. So these are the meadowlarks. They look pretty identical, right? This one's a little chunkier, but I think that's because of the way it's sitting. But they look pretty much the same, right? Similar colorations, um, similar banding pattern on their, on, their, on their feathers. They look similar body sizes, right? You would look at them and say, wow, they might be the same species. And if they're not the same species, they probably evolved from something very similar. There was probably some ancestor between them that diverged, that some, some set of traits evolutionary speaking, diverged, which made them two distinct species. And you could say, well, one of the biggest differences is this little neck piece, right? This little neck coloration here. Maybe that neck coloration is what sci makes scientists call them a different species. But it's not just traits that make things a different species. It's sort of a really sort of basic definition of what a species is. And I, I think that's sort of a nice thing um, to think about when you're, you know, sort of thinking uh, in a um, non-scientific concept, concept. And so with speciation, what we're thinking about is if two things are distinct species, it means there's no gene flow between the two populations. And what I mean by gene flow, it means that there's no successful mating, meaning that these organisms cannot physically mate and produce a viable offspring. Or a, not just a viable offspring, or an offspring that can then go on to reproduce itself. That's what we're talking about with speciation. That's sort of the basic level of definition of speciation. And this is what we call reproductive isolation. When two things can mate and produce a, either a non-viable offspring, so something that dies in the womb or dies shortly after being born, or something that's sterile and then can't pass on its genetic material to the next generation. So that's, all, that's sort of the backbone of what we're gonna be thinking about. Um, and this is something that can happen with either allopatric or um, which is with physical separation, or sympatric, or without physical separation. The so speciation can, can occur, say, um, if I took one species and I put one on an island a thousand miles from the coast and left the other one, um, say, in Texas or something like that. The so speciation can occur um, allopatrically, so being completely separated. But speciation can also occur within the same habitat. And the sort of the thinking about that, um, allopatric uh, um, 
I'm sorry, uh, sympatric speciation, that's what occurred with Darwin's finches, right? They're all in the same group of islands. They could travel between the islands, but they still diverged into different species of finches. And so we can have speciation occur, again, just simply, the, the easiest way to define uh, two different species is can they reproduce and produce viable and non-sterile offspring? But it can happen with or without physical separation. And there's all sorts of ways to prevent things from mating producing viable offspring. And so these things can either be pre or post zygotic. And so you might have heard of zygote or zygotic before sometime in your life. Um, anytime you hear zygote, or it's technically zygo, Z-Y-G-O, that refers to an egg. Zygo is an egg. So when we're saying pre or post zygotic, it's basically before or after being born or before or after the egg. So. Um, when we're thinking about prezygotic, um, there's all sorts of things that can prevent an organism from uh, producing offspring. And so we're thinking about prezygotic, so before the egg, before essentially fertilization. Um, we're thinking about preventing of mating attempts. Um, that's sort of the easiest way to keep two things from having children. Um, habitat isolation, so being on an island versus being on the mainland. Uh, temporal isolation, and what that means is one species reproduces in August and the other reproduces in September. So that physical temporal or time separation is a pretty big barrier for a lot of species. Uh, we have behavioral isolation, meaning that organisms don't do the same mating dance, right? They don't court mates in the same way. Um, and that's a pretty common thing. You know, you think about, you know, if you're, if you're dating, right, you know, some people like to be courted in a different way, right? And that makes you incompatible if you can't court them in the right way, right? That's what we're talking about here. Uh, we have gametic incompatibility, incompatibility, meaning the sperm can't physically fertilize the egg. Um, and then finally, we have incompatible genitalia. And um, for those of you that have been staring at the slide, um, what you're looking at here in the bottom right here, hand corner, um, is, and you didn't know this before, but it's actually the genitalia of different marine mammals. These marine mammals are pretty closely related. So dolphins and porpoises and, and short beaked dolphins and harbor seals are all pretty closely related. Um, but what you notice is that they, they have, um, while sometimes similar structures, they have wildly different genitalia. And this incompatible genitalia actually physically makes it so they cannot reproduce together anymore. Um, and just, you know, some knowledge about what these types of genitalia work, but um, just because, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just making sure everyone's paying attention. Um, this is a pretty common thing in nature. So for instance, insects have taken this to the, the extreme. Most of the differences in species of insects can be attributed to wacky and wild things that happen with the penis as well as the vagina. So um, uh, incompatib incompatible genitalia is actually a pretty common thing in nature. Um, after, sort of, sort of after the egg, um, there's all sorts of post-zygotic um, reproductive isolation that we can see. So we can have what's called hybrid inviability. So the sort of, say if you have a tiger and a lion reproduced together, what comes out the back end, the liger, is essentially inviable. It would say die. Or we can think about um, if you have a successful mating between a horse and a donkey, right, that we produce a mule out the back end of that. A mule is sterile meaning that a mule, while it can exist and grow to be an adult, can't pass on its genetic material to the next generation. So thus, a horse and a donkey, while they can mate, there's no prezygotic incompatibility. What they produce cannot go on to make more mules. You can only make mules by combining a horse and a donkey. And then finally, we have what's called hybrid breakdown. And this one is by far the most common, is that maybe a mating attempt is successful. You've overcome all these different types of isolation um, that are prezygotic. But uh, whatever you end up making just dies in the womb. And so there's, um, there's, this is pretty much what usually happens. Most things physically, there are different species. We'll just, even if fertilization can occur, it'll die essentially immediately in the womb or die shortly thereafter. So most things physically, can't, um, things physically can't make um, a sort of a viable thing that makes it out of the womb. Um, to answer the question in the chat, a mule cannot produce anything. A mule, a mule is completely sterile. So a mule, no matter what you try to mate it with, cannot make anything else. They are completely sterile. Um, and it's because you're combining a horse and a donkey together. And what's produced out the back end, because they have 
different genetic material physically cannot make sperm or they physically cannot make egg. So, mules are sterile and there's no like second generation of mules. It's just you make a mule and that mule lives and dies and that's it. So, um, and that's because it's infertile or sterile. Um, but as I mentioned, the hybrid breakdown is the most common. So if you were to take a um, in a sort of a ghoulish experiment and you combined a, a chimpanzee sperm and a human egg, what came out the back end physically couldn't be born because of this hybrid breakdown. Even though we're super closely related, it would eventually just break down and die because of all the genetic incompatibilities between us and a chimpanzee. Just as a note, I watched, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Ancient Aliens, but my wife likes that show and I watched it with her the other day and they were hypothesizing that that had happened, but I was like, that can't happen because of this. So, not that you need to know that, but I'm telling you anyways. But let's talk about sort of how this speciation occurs. This is um, a cartoon ex ex uh, illustration here, but it, it works. It, it's sort of a nice working definition for how we can think about getting a species to form. And so we have some sort of population and there's gene flow. And remember, gene flow is simply things uh, mating with another, one another and exchanging genetic material. That's what gene flow is. But we can have some sort of population here where we have, you know, in, this is technically just three, but you can pretend it's any size. Um, and we have some sort of barrier to gene flow. And this could be a mountain range. This could be an island. This could be any number of things um, that occur. So there's some barrier that prevents this group from mating with anything in these two groups. Um, and eventually, over time, speciation, as you know, Darwin suggested, it's, um, it's something that takes time. It's not something that happens like this. It's, it's something that takes time. So as time progresses, there's uh, some sort of isolation pop isolated population will diverge. It'll start to slightly change. So you can think about this as if it landed on an island. So pretend like, you know, we're in Massachusetts and Boston, we have a population of birds. Uh, well, that's a bad example. We have a population of mice and then a, then a small population of those mice somehow makes it to the Boston Harbor Islands and it's now becomes isolated. And because the, the Boston Harbor Islands are slightly different, it's starting to diverge. Its traits are starting to get different. Natural selection on the islands is different than what it is in Boston. So these two populations are starting to diverge. And over time, as natural selection does its thing, the populations continue to diverge and diverge and diverge. Now, we have at first um, what we have, what's called the hybrid zone. And this is before the populations are completely diverged, meaning that if I took a mouse from the Harbor Islands and made it with something in, from Boston proper, they could still produce a hybrid individual and that hybrid individual would be still viable. So you still have this before speciation sort of finally occurs, you have this hybrid zone. And there's a couple of different outcomes that we can have. So we can have complete reinforcement where these populations, they just physically can't come back together because of something and they continue to diverge and eventually you get new species, completely new species. So that's, that's sort of the outcome we think about when we're getting new species. And this is what's happened with the Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. We have, um, we have what's called fusion. So maybe these populations come back together. Maybe there's a, a capacity for these mice to swim between the Harbor Islands and Boston proper now. And so now they come back together and they fuse together into being one species or one population where there's gene flow occurring between these two. Or we have some sort of stability event where they don't diverge enough and we always have this hybrid zone. And so they're not really two species, they're just two distinct populations. They might be slightly different, but they're two distinct populations that can still produce viable offspring. And so these are sort of the, 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 sort of the three avenues we can think. When we're trying to make a new species, we really want this. We really want this reinforcement. We really want this divergement, uh, this, I'm sorry, this uh, divergence um, between the two populations. So again, we need to isolate them reproductively. That's sort of the, the, the thing you need to keep in the back of your mind, reproductive isolation, is what really separates two species. There's no G flow, they're two distinct species. And so this leads us to this concept of what's called adaptive radiation. And this is uh, one of the more common ways sort of species um, differentiate from an ancestor is this concept of adaptive radiation. 
So this is what we saw in Darwin's finches when they land, when they had some ancestral finch land on the islands, on these islands, the, the Galapagos Islands that had no other birds. All these different habitats, or what we call a niche. So a niche is just a fancy word for habitat. That's all it is. Um, you might see this in your textbook. You might see this. Um, actually, you see this actually in people using it in common everyday terms, like oh, I'm in my own little niche in the office. But it's just your own little sort of habitat. It's your own sort of like resources. But all the different habitats and niches allow organisms to drift apart. And this is what we saw with Darwin's. Oops, sorry. This is what we saw with Darwin's finches. We had some sort of founder species of finch that landed on the islands, and there was all these different habitats: insects, um, uh, sort of small insects, large insects, um, large seeds, nectar, um, combinations of nectar and insects. And all these different habitats, all these different niches, allowed natural selection to select for the variety of traits that occurred within this founder population, this original species, right? Thinking about beak sizes and head sizes and things like that, that allowed them to diverge into multiple species, allowed them to adaptively radiate into all the crazy species of finches we have on the Galapagos Islands. Just going to wait for my video to unfreeze. Should do that in a second. There we go. Sorry, I froze again. I don't, I don't know why. I'm like five feet away from my router. It makes no sense to me. But. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately, um, a new species landing in an area and sort of radiating out and adapting to all sorts of new habitats or niches is what adaptive radiation is. This is what we see with Darwin's finches. This is a really easy way to, within the same habitat, or sorry, within the same location to make a new species. If you adapt to nectar, it's going to acquire different traits than eating insects. You can see these birds' heads are vastly different. Very different lifestyle, very different set of traits that are useful for hunting insects than there is for drinking nectar. And those differences in habitats allow them to adapt, allow the, in evolution to select for different traits, which allow them to turn into completely different species. And um, <clears throat> As we sort of mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, as I should have mentioned, the artificial selection or humans sort of pushing on nature to do things that are better for humans could eventually lead to a speciation event. Um, but, more, but more commonly, uh, humans are much better at making things go extinct. And when something is extinct, it means it's no longer present on the planet, meaning you can't find a dodo bird anywhere on the planet because humans hunted it to extinction. You can't find passenger pigeons anywhere on this planet because we hunted them to extinction. You can't find dinosaurs anywhere on this planet because an asteroid wipes them out. Right? That's what we mean by extinct, something that is erased from history. I'm sorry, something that is erased from the planet. However, you can still find evidence of extinct animals inside the fossil records. So when we find fossils, so when we find fossils of dinosaurs, sorry. Um, we find fossils of dinosaurs. There we go. We find fossils of dinosaurs. Sorry, my computer stopped working for a second. <laughs> uh, we find fossils of dinosaurs. That's a record of things that have gone extinct. And so the question we can ask is, where do new traits come from? And uh, I, I hope the sort of the connection that we're making between DNA and evolution has become much clearer now. But new traits ultimately come from changes in your DNA sequence. If you're going to have a new trait, if you're going to have a modification of a trait, you need to change your DNA. Remember, your DNA tells you everything about you. And remember, our DNA codes for everything. Deoxyribonucleic acid. We use uh, transcription to make copies of our DNA to then make protein from. Right? That's sort of the flow of information inside of a cell. DNA to RNA to protein. Remember, protein is the action of our cell. So it can, it can be colors, it can be physical actions our cells do. Um, anything you think of, it's done by a protein. But for a protein to, know, to have a protein, we need some sort of underlying DNA to it. Proteins just don't spontaneously form. And so we need to change our DNA. And just as a reminder, DNA, it's a double helix. Everything on the planet has DNA. Um, well, everything on the planet uses DNA in some shape or form. I hesitate because uh, viruses, some viruses like HIV and coronaviruses are RNA viruses, but 
for our purposes of what we're talking about, big things, they all have DNA. And everything has the same four DNA bases. Um, just as a reminder, your DNA is split into 23 pairs of chromosomes. Remember, these are homologous chromosomes, meaning you have two copies of every chromosome. And remember, uh, the instructions to make proteins are encoded in genes, and you have, for every gene on your chromosome, you have a copy of it on one of the chromosomes and a copy of it on another chromosome, that paired, that homologous chromosome. And so just remember, um, alleles can be identical, so you can have two exact copies of the same gene, or they can be very, very variable overall. And so when we're thinking about how we get a new trait, um, very, it really comes down to variation at the gene level. And so when we're thinking about these variability of traits, right, if we're looking at, say, beak size within the finches on the Galapagos Islands, well, there's an underlying frequency of alleles or, or different types of genes in the population, right? For there to be a variation in the beak size, there has to be an underlying variation at the genetic level. And when we're thinking about what sort of this concept is, we're thinking about how evolution occurs. Um, we typically think about it as traits, but when we're thinking about how things change at the DNA level, this is what we call microevolution. How your DNA is changing that then affects how your traits vary. And remember, a variant of every gene is called an allele. And our alleles themselves can be dominant or recessive. And we'll get into sort of this genetics um, a little bit um, later. But uh, sort of thinking about a gene pool is the total collection of alleles in a population. I really hate this Zoom connection in my house. There we go. Um, so just uh, sort of just some, some terminology. A gene pool is the total co collection of alleles in a population. So if I have, um, you know, a population of birds, what's the total pool of alleles that I have for any given trait? Uh, a phenotype is a trait you can physically see. So, a, you know, my phenotype would be blonde hair. That's just a phenotype, a physical trait. The underlying genetics to my blonde hair is what I call my genotype. What is my gene sequence? What is my allele sequence? That's the genotype. And so uh, a sort of a common misconception about evolution is that it, it can create new traits. Evolution as a process doesn't create traits. But instead, you need to think about it as evolution selecting for trait variability that already exists in the population that make these organisms more successful. The environment is selecting for traits that are beneficial. And by selecting for these traits, again, this is not like, again, it's not like a, a higher power selecting for these things. It's just these organisms are doing better in the environment, getting more energy, and thus are likely to pass on the genetic material to the next generation. So the environment is selecting for these organisms, selecting for these traits. And remember, traits are inheritable because traits lie at the DNA level. And if you, if, if you're, if you have desirable traits for an environment, they're being selected for, and they're being passed down, which means your offspring are more likely to have your traits. So, oh wow, this, um, this got blurry somehow. But the way new traits arise in the most simple way is through mutation. And so when we're thinking, um, we're thinking of, um, of new traits, we're thinking about mutations. And this is the primary way new traits come along. And Mutations are not like X-Men. They're not like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's, that's not what's going on here. Mutations are generally small, most oftentimes single base pair changes in your DNA. So for instance, going from a T to an A, that's a mutation. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about you know, completely like changing your entire chromosome. We're talking about small changes. This is how evolution, this is how mutations work. This is what evolution acts upon, is small changes. We don't really sort of change uh, whole scale our DNA, but we can change, we, there's small, chale, small scale changes in our DNA. These are what we call mutations. Um, and so we can think about some, some cases of mutations. So there's three classes of mutations that we see inside proteins. So we can think of sort of the basic way. We have TTC. Um, that TTC is transcribed to AAG. And the ultimate amino acid we make is lysine. So this is how normal things look, right? This is a no mutation uh, situation. We can look at what's called a silent mutation where we change one base 
from TTT to AAA, I'm sorry, some, sorry, from TTC to TTT, so we're just changing that one base, a C to a T, that changes the mRNA to AAA, but if you remember our codon table from two lectures ago, we're seeing that we're still making lysine. So this is what we call a silent mutation. It's changing the DNA, it's changing the RNA, but it's not changing the amino acid we make. So this is what we call a silent mutation. Um, next up, we have what's called a nonsense mutation, where you're seeing we change the T to an A here. That changes the mRNA to UAG, which makes a stop codon. And um, I didn't really go over stop codons, but stop codons are what terminate a protein. So when your ribosome senses a stop codon in the mRNA, it stops making the protein. And so what this nonsense mutation would do is it would take a protein, say that was 100 amino acids long, it would say stop it halfway through. So you would have a, a truncated or a protein that was smaller than it was supposed to be. And you can imagine that might be pretty detrimental, right? A smaller than, average, a smaller than you meant to protein might be pretty dangerous, right? You might do something completely different than what your protein was supposed to do. Right? It might completely change function. So you can imagine, like, maybe this is a pretty powerful way to change your DNA. And it actually is. It's a really powerful way to change your DNA. Um, and then next up, we have um, sort of two cases. We have what's called a missense mutation, where we're changing, in this first case, a T to a C. In the second case, we're changing a T to a G. It changes the mRNA. And both of these cases change the amino acid. But what you will notice is that, um, well, actually, it's kind of hard to see, so you really can't see, so I, I apologize, but you're seeing that um, this box around the amino acid here, it tells you that this is a basic R group of our, of our amino acid, and this is an, a polar um, R group of our amino acid. So these amino acids have different properties, and as you'll remember from our DNA lecture, the properties of the amino acids give the ultimate protein its structure, and that structure dictates function. So changing the amino acid can have some pretty deleterious side effects. But in one case, we're, changing, we're not really changing the properties. We still have a basic amino acid in arginine, and the thyronine uh, we're making here it becomes polar. So we're potentially massively changing the protein here, and probably not so much here. But what's important is that these two types of mutation, nonsense and missense, have changed proteins. And remember, proteins are what are responsible for your traits. You can change your protein, you can change your trait. But these silent mutations, they don't, they're not really manifested majorly. If you have enough of silent mutations that eventually change into one of these other types of mutations, maybe. But when we're thinking about how new traits arise, we're thinking about these nonsense and missense mutations, dramatically changing the protein, which may confer some new trait. So you imagine if I have insulin, right? If I have an insulin molecule and I have a silent mutation in the insulin, um, <clears throat> well, the silent mutation in the insulin won't change anything. This nonsense and this missense might dramatically change the insulin I'm making and thus make the insulin not work. So mutations are the most common way <clears throat> things, um, uh, new traits arise. Um, but one other ways we commonly see new traits arise is through gene duplication. And when you're, making, when you're making new cells for the next uh, sort of, when you're reproducing, um, I'm sorry, uh, when you're making new cells to say replace old cells, you can make errors when copying your DNA. And so sometimes when organisms are, are making copies of their DNA, they make multiple copies of genes. And that's not uncommon. Um, it happens, you know, one in every 10 billion um, cases in your average human, um, much more frequently in bacteria, but it's not uncommon. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, typically, when you have two copies of one gene, <sighs> really wish this would stop freezing every five minutes. There we go. I'm back. Um, so when you have two copies of a gene on the same chromosome, not your homologous chromosome, but on the same chromosome, you have extra DNA. You don't need two exact copies on the exact same chromosome. And so when you have two copies of the same gene on one chromosome, well, you don't really care about the second one. And so you're, when you're sort of, your, your cells are doing their thing, they'll tolerate mutations that occur to these extra copies of these genes. 
And by tolerating all these potential errors, these mutations that occur to these extra copies of the gene, it could potentially lead to a brand new function, a brand new protein. And the idea being is if we have a gene with four, uh, or we have four genes, um, or I'm sorry, we have a gene with multiple functions, and there's some duplication event, well, we can think of a couple scenarios where we can, um, we can potentially lose function of part of the gene, we can completely lose function of all parts of the gene, or we can have a specialization of this. And so this is how gene duplications work. You can you duplicate a gene and something happens to it. Your, your body makes mistakes on it, um, um, and it can diverge in any number of different ways, lose functions, specialize in functions, and um, uh, sort of uh, lose partial function. And you know, this might, this, I'm sorry, this might seem sort of um, uh, like, who cares? But this is actually how your different types of hemoglobin arose. So ancestrally speaking, in an uh, ancestor of, of, of humans, uh, we had a duplication event of our hemoglobin genes, and they ultimately led to uh, um, subfunctionalization over here, um, essentially splitting the function between two copies of the genes, um, which is why you have hemoglobin A and hemoglobin B, just as a note. So you can create new traits by gene duplication. Um, in addition, when we talked about Richard Lenski's experiment, when we talked about Richard Lenski's experiment the other day, um, the new traits that arose in Richard Lenski's experiment actually came about by a duplication as well. So there was a duplication in the gene over evolutionary time. It got selected for to essentially uh, tolerate mutations. And as those mutations were tolerated, um, it arose a new function. So a gene duplication event inside this population of E. coli that we talked about is what led to this new function of the E. coli population here being able to use citrate. Um, in addition, you can have what's called gene loss. And so if you're not using a gene, if you're, if you're not using it, you're likely to lose it. And by losing genes, shedding genes from your genome, you could potentially create a brand new species. And so this is actually what we see with one of the most important um, species on the planet, at least for uh, human nutrition. And this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, this is baker's yeast. So this is what makes bread. This is what makes wine. This is what makes beer. This is what makes all the things that are awesome and fermented. That's Saccharomyces. And so there, and there's a, a modern day relative of Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces castellii. And um, at some point in evolutionary time, they had a relative. And there, there was a genome of this relative that had 5,200 genes in its genome. It's not very big genome. Humans have about 25,000 genes in our genome, depending on who you ask. Um, so this is a particularly small genome. At some point in the history of this ancestor, there was a duplication of the entire genome. And this might seem like, well, that, that probably doesn't happen. It actually happens a lot. Um, duplication of genomes is pretty common in plants. So if you look at, uh, for instance, corn, corn carries eight copies of its genome. Don't ask me why, I'm not a plant person, but I know corn carries eight copies of its genome all the time. It's what we call an octopoid. But the ancestor of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces castellii um, had some sort of du genome duplication event. So it doubled the amount of genes. So that essentially, uh, um, you know, one co two copies of every gene. Um, over evolutionary time, as these two populations lived in different areas, there was a massive loss of duplicated genes. Um, and essentially, um, we led to, first led to a loss of, of um, you know, at some recent ancestor that had about 6,000 genes. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae, our baker's yeast, lost about 230 of those genes. And Saccharomyces castellii lost about 150 of those genes. And because they lost genes slightly differently, that led to them becoming new species. So at the genetic level, they're very, very distinct. They're completely new species because while they had an ancestor that had a lot of genes, they lost them in a very distinct pattern that allowed them to become new species. Um, that being said, um, as we'll learn um, when we talk about microbes, these, these two organisms would never have traditional sex. Um, they re reproduce asexually. So there's no barrier to sex here. Um, in terms of gene flow, they just don't exchange genes at all, just as a note. Um, <clears throat> in addition to um, sort of uh, 
duplication of genomes and loss of genes and duplication of genes. Uh, sexual reproduction is a fantastic way to bring together new combinations of alleles, which will potentially bring new traits. So when we think about, um, oops, when we think about sort of um, how, uh, 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 we make human embryos, so how we make sperm and egg. They go through a process, we're going to talk about this later in the semester, but the process is called meiosis. And when you're making your sperm and egg, or, you know, if you're, you're just making one because you're not, you, humans don't make both, we just make one or the other. Um, during the process of making sperm and egg, again, through a process called meiosis, we have a, sort of a random shuffling of our chromosomes. And by a random shuffling of our chromosomes, we create gametes or sex cells, sperm and egg, that have unique combinations of our DNA. And when you combine that sort of these unique combinations of our DNA in sperm and egg with another sperm or egg, you put together a huge amount of combinations. So by combining DNA from two distantly related organisms, you can bring together potentially new traits. In addition, by shuffling your own genome, you sort of mix up different alleles as well which is, this is sort of the reason why you don't always 100% look like your parents. You might resemble them, or you might look exactly like your parents, but most of you don't look exactly like your parents. And it's because you're shuffling your parents' genome. So when the, the egg or the sperm that made you had a shuffled version of your parents' genome. And by combining both your parents together, you're combining two potentially distantly related gene pools that are then again shuffling these traits around again. And so every time you sort of produce a sperm or an egg, it's a one in one, it's like essentially one in one trillion chance that it's an identical one. It's a really sort of great way, uh, this process of making sperm and eggs in humans is a really great way of adding, of sort of creating novel diversity. And more importantly, by combining embryo, combining sperm and egg from two different people is also a great way to introduce new genetic information. And by sort of combining genetic information, well, you potentially can bring about new traits. So you could, you could think of like, um, you know, bringing, you know, green eyes is a great example of brand new traits by sex, right? Green eyes are come together by mixing of, of special two, two distinct types of gene groups together that then make green eyes. So, um, and sort of one of the other ways, uh, and one of the final ways, if I'm not mistaken, is um, uh, how we get new traits is this concept called transposons. And so transposons or transposable elements are genes that jump from one part of your chromosome to another. And these were discovered by a, a really fascinating woman. Her name was Barbara McClintock. She was working at Cornell University in the 1940s. And uh, if she's sort of like uh, Rosalind Franklin that I sort of spoke about when we talked about how DNA was discovered. She's sort of, um, at least till modern times, was sort of a forgotten woman. She was a um, really good scientist, but because she was a woman working in science since in the 1940s, she was sort of just sort of pushed to the side. People didn't really want to believe what she was saying, even though she had all this great scientific evidence. But because she was a woman, she was sort of looked over and sort of glossed over. Um, it's sort of unfortunate because she did some absolutely incredible work that we're now realizing is super duper important to science. But um, so if you want to read about an awesome woman in science, uh, Barbara McClintock is a, is a really fascinating woman to read about as well. Um, but she discovered these transposons, and the idea being is if we have uh, two pieces of DNA, we have a transposable element or a transposon. She called them jumping genes because she didn't have any uh, idea what they were at first. And what you would see is a gene would jump from one piece of DNA to another, and vice versa, or sometimes vice versa. But you basically had genes jumping from one chromosome to another, or one part of one chromosome to another. One thing we haven't really touched upon is this idea of order. Uh, inside your genome, the way things are ordered is important for the way they're expressed. And so if you change the order of your genes, you can potentially create brand new traits by mixing up combinations. And the combination she was seeing is actually in corn. And so she was studying, oops, uh, she was studying corn. And uh, corn naturally, Kind of drink. My computer froze again, or the internet, or the video froze again, I should say. It's like every 10 minutes, like clockwork. All right, I'm back. So I, might, I don't know what's going on with the video. I don't know. Anyway, she was working on corn. And so the corn that we know and love today is, is yellow. This is what we buy in the grocery store. 
Natural populations of corn have red, have red in them. They have all sorts of different colors in them, browns. But um, she was working on corn populations that were mixed and combinations of red and white, um, red and yellow in them. And what she was doing is studying these transposons. And so remember, jumping between one section of the genome to another. What the idea being, <clears throat> um, what the idea being that um, by jumping, in, jumping from one part of the chromosome to another, you could potentially mix different colors together. So we're seeing a transposon jump from one part of the chromosome to another, in, potentially inserting itself into a different part. The idea being is if I have a, the gene that controls yellow color, it jumps into the middle of a gene controlling, say, red color. Well, those genes are going to be expressed together, giving us these hybrid colors, these corn kernels that are yellow and red. And that's what a transposon does. It jumps in between or jumps next to a gene, but then they become transcribed together. So you have a mixing of colors, mixing of traits. Now, this might seem sort of trivial, but this is a powerful way to create new traits in nature because if you mix colors, that might attract different things, which might in turn arise different traits, right? Different evolutionary partnerships. But again, we're creating new traits by mixing pieces of your own DNA together. This is not something that happens in humans. We only know that it happens in plants and bacteria up, at this, up to this point, but um, it is something that happens in nature. It is, it is a way we can get new traits in nature. Oops, uh, and one of the uh, sort of the interesting ways and my favorite way we get new traits into species is what's called horizontal gene transfer or HGT. And this is when we have to transfer genes from one species to another without sex. So picture like me grabbing uh, oak leaf out there, smashing it onto my skin, and I pick up some DNA from an oak leaf. That's horizontal gene transfer. Moving of DNA from one species to another without mating. Um, and the best way we sort of understand horizontal gene transfer is through bacteria. And so bacteria can directly, um, oops, uh, can directly exchange DNA with one another without having sex. So we can have one bacteria die and another bacteria can physically pick up the DNA from the environment and incorporate it to its own genome, thus getting new traits, thus potentially becoming a new species. So that's, that's one. Another really great way, um, and we're going to skip over this middle one for a sec, is direct sex with bacteria. Um, so bacteria, they don't have sex in the sort of the traditional way. There's no sperm and egg or anything like that. But they can physically, horizontally, without sex, exchange pieces of their chromosomes with one another. Um, so that's another way of horizontal gene transfer works. So we have two living bacteria that swap genetic material. It's not sex because there's no sperm and egg or anything like that. Uh, and then the final way, it's called transduction. And this is when we have a virus pick up DNA from a bacteria that it's killed and then inject it into a new bacteria, thus, and then that DNA gets incorporated into the bacteria's genome forever. And so transduction is a really sort of powerful way to move DNA across distantly related species. So these are the three mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer. And uh, I, I will just make a note that this does not happen in humans. This does also not happen in humans. You can't physically pick up DNA from the food you eat, from anything you're exposed to. So the, all the people that try to fear monger you with saying that um, GMOs are bad because you're going to pick up DNA from a genetically modified organism is just 100% bullshit. That doesn't happen in humans. Just as a note, um, there's a lot of bad stuff out there about GMOs, and this is not one of them. Um, uh, this, sort of, this, this sort of middle route here, this transduction, is um, actually pretty common. And so when you look at the human genome, you can actually see that about 7 to 10 percent, depending on who you look at, is actually viral DNA. So about, again, upwards of 10 percent of your genome is viruses. So you acquired 10 percent of your genome from another organism that was a virus. Pretty cool, right? So you're 10% virus. I think that's pretty fascinating. So, um, but again, viruses, um, as we'll talk about um, in the coming classes, viruses can pick up pieces of uh, a previous animal's DNA and inject them into a new host and become permanent parts of that new host. So um, not only do we have the virus's genome, you also can pick up new traits from other organisms. And so there's all sorts of examples of, of viral sort of transmitted 
um, traits um, inside the human genome that were derived from, say, plants or bacteria or fungi. Um, the best example I can give you is actually your immune response. Many of your immune response genes are actually from viruses. So, fun fact. Um, and this, so you can imagine by transferring sort of pieces of chromosomes from one species to another, you can acquire new traits. And by acquiring new traits, you could potentially speciate into a brand new species. Um, another sort of way that we uh, can observe this is actually in plants. This is a really powerful way that we um, have used horizontal gene transfer to make um, genetically altered plants. And so we use a bacteria to do this, uh, and we still do this pretty commonly. Um, the bacteria is called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It's a soil bacteria. It naturally likes to infect plants. And so if you're ever walking in the forest or you're ever walking anywhere there's trees and you see a giant sort of uh, tumor looking structure on a tree, um, this, that's what we call a gall, and that's because of Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So it's a bacteria that likes to naturally infect plants. And the way it infects plants is by actually injecting its DNA. So it has, you know, some underlying genetic material here that it likes to inject into plants, reprogram the plants, and change the behavior of the plants. And then it takes advantage of that changed behavior. So that's what Agrobacterium uses normally. But humans have actually used agrobacterium stuck in genes that we like um, inside agrobacterium, make them inject them into plants to genetically modify plants. So this is something we've actually used to make our lives better. So like, you know, golden rice, this is how golden rice came to be. Um, and many other sort of uh, uh, genetically modified plants that we, um, that we use, which pretty much is all of them. Um, but uh, this is also how you exchange DNA between two kingdoms, two different kingdoms, so bacteria to plants. So this is how plants can acquire new traits by being infected with bacteria. Uh, this can't happen with us, um, just as a note. So. Um, finally, one other sort of way we can get new traits is by breeding. And so um, you can select for different traits that you like to in two different species, bring them together, and to get brand new traits. And given enough evolutionary time, new traits, remember, can lead to new species. And the best example, <coughs> excuse me, I can give of this is dogs, right? There are tons and tons of species of dogs. And by selective breeding, um, which pip, with pit bulls here at the bottom left being the best, because that's what my dog is, she's a pit bull. Um, with selective breeding, we can bring together all sorts of crazy new traits. Um, and potentially create new, not just breeds of dogs, but potentially new species of dogs if enough time has passed. Again, a species being something that is reproductively isolated. So with that, let's, uh, let's just sort of summarize the sort of the, the main key points that you need to take home from this lecture. Is, uh, remember that a species is two or more reproductively isolated population of organisms. This can occur either within the same habitat or in a geographically separated habitat. Um, Physical space is the best way to drive the difference between two species, um, because if you have a species living on an island versus in Texas, very different habitats likely to lead to speciation over time. Um, new changes, I'm sorry, new traits can be acquired in many, many ways. Evolution does not create traits. Evolution selects traits that are already present, but it physically can't create traits. But what creates traits is subtle changes in the genome changing the DNA sequence, which thus changes the RNA sequence, which eventually changes the protein sequence. And so mutations are what really give us new traits. And remember, if we're going to create a new species, we need to create new traits. Um, and that is done solely through um, mutations, changes to that DNA. So evolution, um, while Darwin didn't know it, the mechanism by which evolution was acting upon was the DNA. So DNA, when we're thinking about it, is really the mechanism by which we care most about when we're thinking about evolution. Evolution, you know, there's all these traits and stuff like that, but the underlying mechanism is DNA. Remember, your DNA is everything about you. So with that, um, that's going to be the end of today's class. Uh, I hope you um, learned something. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'll hang around for a bit as I usually do. Um, um, and remember, if you haven't dropped me a line in the thing about what you think about Lamarck um, or what you think about epigenetics, please take the time to do that because um, that's, uh, again, free extra credit points for just, you know, you guys get it because you showed up and no one else has the opportunity to do that. So I'll, uh, I'll 
13 of you have the chance to earn extra credit points just because you showed up. So drop me a line, tell me what you think, ask a question, get your, uh, get your points. <laughs> so, uh, but with that, if you guys have any questions, like I said, I'll hang around. But otherwise, hope you guys have a good day. Hope you guys stay cool because it's hot. Thank you. <sighs>